and I will be your host, Simon Holbooch. I run Bath Astronomers. So um, we'd like to keep the mics open as long as you haven't got kids, you're eating your uh, dinner or whatever. But if it becomes a problem, we'll mute everyone other than the speaker. Okay, that way we can have a bit more interactive on questions and things. But if you are a little bit noisy, don't be upset if we um, uh, uh, covertly uh, switch your, you into silence, okay? Um, I'll, but, I'll keep mine on mute. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. All right. Do you... About a couple of minutes. Okay, so this is the June um, Bath Astronomers. And um, Tony, didn't, oh, sorry, Roger didn't give me a title. Um, and so I actually I invented one for Roger. Hopefully uh, it uh, uh, covers all the aspects that uh, uh, you've got, but uh, um, turning photos into wow in images. That's what, uh, that's what I've sold you as, Roger. So um, I, I, I hope you can deliver. All right. <laughs> um, but this is the Bath Astronomers Society. Um, um, we have a committee of five and they're all pictured down below. And I'll you can get in contact with, with us. Oh, I, okay, I'll, I'll, Chris. Have you I'll, changed I'll, your <laughs> Patrick Moore disguise? I have. I have. Uh, <laughs> I've gone a bit more normal. And uh, um, but yes, we've got uh, Abby, we've got Chris, Dennis, uh, Jonathan, and myself, and we help run the society. Um, uh, current membership is just eighteen, um, but uh, we're very keen. And we do uh, lots of outreach uh, bits and pieces. This is our last session um, before the summer break, but uh, depending on how COVID goes, that uh, hopefully we'll be organising perhaps some stargazing, uh, quite distant and lined up from each other, but uh, perhaps some stargazing over the summer if possible, because there's, there's lots of things going on and it'd be a shame to miss them. So tonight's plan, I um, want to go through just a sort of little uh, news and of what's been going on recently um, and then sort of look forward over those two months for what uh, potentially you might want to be looking at and sort of a few ideas on what you can do to keep yourself going and then I'll turn the, uh, the reins over to Roger and he can escort us through all the uh, sort of uh, how he's taken um, his uh, prior photographic interest into astrophotography over quite a short period of time and the results um, as we saw earlier on in the year during our members evening are, are really quite astounding. So hopefully you can remember having seen a number of these faces. These are the people that have spoken to us and done uh, presentations uh, over the last or well, since September 2019. Um, we've got, um, oh, Roger, you've already uh, spoken to us. I couldn't actually find a good one of Sandy. I found one of his head behind the telescope. So I used that photo. Um, okay. <laughs> but we've had James Fragley, Mark Woodland, uh, Roger Picard talking about variable stars. Charles talked about all the fun stuff he likes looking at the sky. We had Owen Brazell up in up the right hand corner. He was talking to us about planetary nebula. And uh, Bob Meisen gave us our first sort of online talk with eight great astronomers and then last month we had Ezzy talking about rovers and landers um, so it was quite uh, apt in terms of the time so since September we've actually done 50 events uh, whether they be talks whether they're going into schools um, setting up telescopes outside Sainsbury's to see the Mercury transit um, uh, last year all that kind of thing talks to other sites. So as, despite the fact we went into a bit of a shutdown in March, 50 isn't too bad. So um, uh, we've, we've cancelled lots of stuff over the summer, but it's quite a surprise to see that we actually managed to get 50 in before uh, things sort of uh, went a bit quiet. Um, we work with our sister, uh, which is the um, uh, now called the Herschel Society. And hopefully if this plays, um, Every year they give out an award to um, the leading um, uh, postdoc uh, female uh, astronomer, um, typically working currently, well, currently working within the UK um, to recognise uh, their achievements. And uh, the prize lectureships given out annually, and this uh, time it's been. The <laughs> 
Hey guys, welcome back to another Night Sky News for June 2020. Like seriously, how did it get to June already? I don't know how this happened. But we have so much astrophysics news to talk about. But first of all, let's start by thinking about what we can see in the night sky. Okay, so that, that's, she does Dr. Becky on YouTube. So yes. as well as actually being a, a nine to five professional astronomer, she does loads of outreach um, and she's doing these videos on a weekly basis now uh, on various topics. Um, she works uh, with Professor Chris, uh, Chris Lintot and so um, she's up at the University of Oxford. So um, we don't know when she's going to come and speak um, to the Herschel Society and ourselves. The invite is extended to ourselves. Um, and all the other local societies and uh, the general public as well. It's typically in November that that event occurs and it's up at the uh, University of Bath. But uh, given the current um, uh, situation, we don't know if it's going to be scheduled for this year or for next. Um, so we'll just have to watch this space um, to see. But uh, yes, uh, she is the successful winner. There's, there's, not only does she get to come and talk, she gets a cash prize. So the money's already in her bank. So um, perhaps the promotion, uh, the, the videos are pretty slick already on YouTube, but perhaps they'll be even slicker uh, a week or so's time because of the, the uh, additional cash she's got uh, for winning the prize. <laughs> Let's get past that. So what's, what's everyone been looking at um, over the last uh, few weeks? Well, hopefully, um, you'll have got the opportunity to see some of these. Um, so uh, what we've got here is noctilucent clouds. Now this is one of the first showings about two weeks ago that started coming along um, and they've got quite a bit stronger uh, since this morning showing. Um, and I think as Chris pointed out, they don't quite look as impressive when you have them on a computer screen as when you actually have them up in front of you. Um, but essentially you're seeing electric blue clouds, but the sun's still below the horizon. And these clouds are about 70 to 80 kilometers high. Um, they're grains, or oh, they're uh, ice crystals that have formed around grains of what could be um, uh, remnants of meteors, uh, the dust up there, could be pollution. Um, uh, I think the, the smart money appears to be going on the meteor side of things. Um, because there hasn't been a dip. There was expected to be a dip if it was caused by pollution, given our worldwide crisis. And pollution has do uh, dropped a little bit in the upper atmosphere. But uh, we've still got uh, a good session of noctilucent. So we've got a bit more structure coming out here. But if you don't mind the plagiarism, Chris, I have credited you. I stole this from your YouTube, uh, not your YouTube, from your Facebook. And again, um, We've got uh, some nice uh, structure in Chris's photo here. Um, it's Chippenham, you took this, Chris? Yeah. Nah. Um, uh, and it, it's unmistakable, the electric blue yeah. nature of it. Um, you can see it um, if you just wait till sundown, about nine, anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes after sunset, or the same, 60 and 90 minutes before sunrise. So unfortunately, that means it's just after midnight. You need to poke your head out the window and look to the north um, west uh, in the evening and uh, first thing in the morning before sunrise, which unfortunately is going to be about three o'clock in the morning. You need to be looking towards the northeast and uh, you may well get to see these bright blue electric clouds. Um, they're very impressive. And they're, they're, it's that kind of weirdness because they're completely out of place. And they do have a nice bit of structure. And over a period of about 15 to a minutes to half an hour, they do change. Um, uh, now that's mostly because the angle of the sun is changing and it's illuminating differently. But there, there's, there is a slight sort of uh, a feeling that they are actually moving as well. So what else uh, have we had the opportunity to have a look at? Well, the occultation uh, last Friday, um, so there was a lunar occultation of Venus. So this is someone else's photo that I stole. Um, and this is uh, Venus, the nice sharp crescent, moving towards a very thin crescent moon. And it just hid behind the crescent moon at about 8.30, 8.40 uh, last Friday morning. And it popped out the other side 
um, about 940. I haven't seen the photos of uh, it, it merging. All the photos I've seen so far have been it going behind. Um, so that was wonderful. I think lots of people, hopefully everyone, uh, was out looking for this particular thing. It's quite tough to spot the moon when it's this um, uh, smaller crescent, but Venus made it a little bit easier target. But from Bath, that's what you got to see. So we had wall-to-wall -wall cloud, um, although I was ready to see it, telescopes <laughs> ready to be chucked outside, um, didn't get to see it because uh, we had a 100% uh, cloud on every single load, low, medium and high in all the weather forecasts, and it did turn out to be just that. So that was a bit of a shame. Um, they don't come along too often, but um, often enough that, uh, okay, we, just need to wait a few years and uh, there'll, there'll be um, other uh, occultations. You get occultations of Jupiter, Saturn, it just depends on the odds. So um, we'll just keep checking and then hopefully there'll be another one along, along soon. So what else have we got um, that uh, could have been uh, viewed over the last uh, week or so? Well, that wonderful point where you get the longest day and the summer solstice. English Heritage closed the stones and everything was online for the summer solstice this year, but I don't think anyone told Druid King Arthur Pendragon this. And so he was out in the rain getting very, very sodden and wasn't allowed within the inner rings this year by English Heritage. So getting wet outside. Um, um, not particularly special for astronomers other than the fact that um, uh, it's when we have our, our longest day. Um, and so the least night, so the least amount of time to look at the sky. Um, so what else has been going on? Well, I thought I'd take a capture of um, our skies last night. And this is from the um, all sky cam that I have looking up over um, Bath. Uh, so there's quite a lot of light pollution because of Bath. But I just sort of show you some of the sites that um, were around last night. So this is 11 o'clock last night. and um, hopefully you can see some of the bright stars that are there. So just if I pencil in some of them, uh, we've got uh, over here, we've got Ursa Major, the, the Big Dipper. Uh, we've got, it points down to a very bright star called Arcturus, and that's in Boites. It's a nice crown, it's called Corona Borealis, which is a curve of stars, but also has lots of galaxies and things, uh, objects of interest. And we've got a funny shape of uh, Hercules here as well. And just about here, there's a very, very bright um, globular cluster of interest. And below Hercules is the often missed, but a Fuchsius or Fichius, which is a constellation which the sun does go through. So it should be a sign of uh, the zodiac, but that would make it 13 and probably a little too unlucky. Um, so that doesn't get a designation. And then we move on through the night until we get to about halfway through. So I'll stop at about one o'clock. There we go. And it's a lot, a lot darker because the sun's only just go, it goes down at uh, just after 10. And so it's still light around 11ish. But by one, we've got as dark as it's going to get. Um, and what are the main constellations here? Oops. We've got um, uh, Lyra um, and the bright star Vega. We've got the Swan, which is Cygnus. And we've got down here, the Eagle Aquila. Um, and so if you look at the bright stars up here, we've got the Summer Triangle, this star to Vega and down here. So you've got those three. So that's a, a, a definite sign that the summer is here, although it's currently at one o'clock in the morning. But as the summer wears on, that'll be our sort of due south view that you'll be getting quite regularly of those three stars. And up uh, ahead, we've got Cepheus and we've got the W of Cassiopeia on the top. I'll just hide that. So a nice W up there. So loads of things to see. Uh, in terms of just getting to know your way around um, that. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll see in the contrast here, but can you make out on your screens what the Milky Way here? Is there enough contrast on your screens? Just a little bit. Yeah. 
Now that's a lot of light pollution that's going on in Bath and it's currently set to do um, try and capture meteors rather than the Milky Way here. Um, <laughs> I have a visitor. Okay. So if we run it through to the rest of the morning, there's a few uh, meteors and satellites whizzing around. Not too many aeroplanes. And then by three o'clock, this is when the noctilucent clouds will be ending um, and the sun will be coming up uh, very shortly after this. Um, so it's a very short evening, effectively just four hours of actual dark um, or uh, it's dark enough to uh, look for some uh, reasonable stuff. So what else is happening? Uh, let's move into July and we've got the sun is going to be its furthest away from us at this point. It's called the Apelian and it happens or every year around about the 4th of July and uh, because the sun's further away or we're further away from the sun um, you get to see a slightly uh, smaller sun but it's very much like the super moons that people talk about. You wouldn't really notice it unless you try to make, take an accurate measure. But here's an example of the two hemispheres. One's at the closest when around January the 4th and then one is here uh, on July the 4th. So it's a, it's a marginal size difference um, through to just because of the distance there. So that's something to potentially look out. But what is the sun actually looking like at the moment? It is particularly dull. Uh, this, is sh this is sort of a uh, solar dynamics orbiter, uh, sorry, observatory from two weeks ago. And there was one sunspot group that you could see uh, in one, a white light. And um, I, I managed to see this one. This isn't my photo, this is SDO's. Um, but that's because I was trying to see a transit of the uh, International Space Station across the sun. And I saw this sunspot and then the clouds came in just when the, the transit actually occurred. So I saw the sunspot, I missed the transit uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, the sun is completely naked. There's nothing to see in white light. There's lots going in hydrogen alpha and uh, prominences on the corner, um, but uh, nothing particularly major at the moment. Um, and the one thing to, I suppose that we can take if, if you're one of those diehards who hates the summer, I love the summer, but if, if you hate it, the one thing to take away from this diagram is when, although there's no official darkness at the moment, we're, we have twilight that lasts from the end of May through to um, the end of July, we're halfway through that. So we're heading towards nights which will actually be truly dark in terms of um, the definition of astronomical twilight and it, it sort of uh, although it gets hotter and warmer it'll get darker so that'll be good for Rogers photos. Um, uh, they're back I've been uh, out in the garden taking a few photos of these guys um, they're uh, regular uh, have been in the mornings now um, for several months but they're just improving all the time and they're creeping into uh, our, uh, night, uh, our evening skies, our midnight skies, and they'll reach um, opposition. So that's when they'll be the best to see where the Earth will be between us. Oh, but the Earth will be between them and the Sun, and so they'll be at their brightest uh, to see. So these these are images I took of Saturn and of um, uh, Jupiter, and the respective oppositions are marked. So uh, in about three weeks' time, we've got. Uh, Jupiter at its finest and then a week after uh, Saturn will be at its finest. So they'll be, they'll be biggest, the biggest they are this year, they'll be the brightest they are this year. Um, still you've got to be up around uh, midnight and into the early hours uh, to get them when they're going to be high enough and interesting enough to uh, image or have a good gawk. But throughout, they're going to be here for the rest of the year. So um, things will improve in terms of not having to stay up quite so late uh, to see them. Um, so why is this particularly interesting coming up to opposition? Well, okay, the plants are bigger, but you, are the, you get some other effects. So one of the effects you might want to have a look at that happens to Saturn over this time is called opposition surge. So here's a little uh, segment about opposition surge. Let's play. 
Most astronomers, with a few notable exceptions, such as Giovanni Cassini, believed that the rings were solid. By 1852, several astronomers had observed that you could actually see the globe of Saturn through one of the rings, and the solid ring hypothesis began to fall out of favour. Around that time, James Clerk Maxwell showed mathematically that the rings could not be solid or liquid because they would break up. Maxwell concluded that the rings must be made of a huge number of solid particles. In 1887, astronomer Hugo von Seeliger proposed a test that could confirm or refute Maxwell's hypothesis. If the rings are made of particles, then some particles will cast shadows on others or block them from view. Then when Saturn approaches opposition, that is, when Earth is between Saturn and the Sun, the shadows would no longer be apparent from that viewing angle and the rings should surge in brightness. Astronomers made careful measurements of the brightness of Saturn's rings and showed that they changed in brightness exactly as Zeliger had predicted, and so concluded that the rings must be made of small particles. This effect came to be called the Zeliger effect, though it's now known that it is not the only phenomenon that causes the rings to surge in brightness. So um, if you really want to actively have a look at Saturn over the build-up and uh, towards opposition and afterwards, um, if you're taking your photos with similar exposures, then you should be able to track the Zeliger effect and see if you can capture it within your images. So that um, uh, in the two or three days around opposition, uh, Saturn should appear brighter, um, despite the fact you're using the same exposure um, to take those photos. So that's worth having a look. Um, other things to have a look out for, um, around the 6th of July in the morning, um, there'll be loads of stuff uh, in the sky. Um, it, it looks like we've got uh, Venus, uh, Uranus, Mars, uh, Saturn, Jupiter and the Moon, but also uh, snuck in there actually is Neptune. So Neptune will be in that. So if you wanted to capture almost all the planets bar one in one viewing session, then the opportunity is the morning of the 6th of July or in and around that time. Um, so loads to bag just in one go. Um, we've got uh, on the 20th of July, we've got the launch of Perseverance. Um, so that should be um, uh, quite exciting. Um, a long time to wait until it actually gets there, another nine months. Um, but watching the launch um, uh, will be a good start and uh, we can wish it well on its way. Um, and then when we get into August, we've got other things going on. Uh, so uh, the remnants of Comet Swift Tuttle come to us as the Perseid Meteor Shower on the 12th and 13th of August. So that's always good for a range of camping trips around. So you, uh, you can stay up late and uh, just watch them uh, coming down. The rates vary a lot, um, but if you can get to a reasonably darkish sky, um, then you can expect uh, personally to see anywhere between 15 to 20 um, uh, on a, a reasonable night, as long as the cloud uh, it, uh, keeps away. Um, other things that are going on, uh, the Federation of Astronomical Societies has at last sort of put its position on the Starlink satellites, and it's come down quite heavily on they're a bad thing. Um, and so um, the FAS newsletter is available and I think there's a link to, uh, for anyone on the website to uh, go and get the current uh, update of the newsletter. The newsletter is effectively two pages of commentary and then the appendix is all about information. So if you wanted to wise up so your arguments of why you hated Starlink are accurate, then you should read the back uh, 16 to 18 pages of the FAS newsletter. Um, people are still loving it. They're still watching it whiz across this is speeded up and um, this video that I stole but uh, it's still quite impressive and there's a launch that's uh, tomorrow evening and if it stays clear it should be visible from the UK um, so the launch is trying to remember now I, th I think the launch is just before 10 o'clock tomorrow evening and then um, uh, possibilities for it being visible in the UK um, it might be still too light but I'll publish some times out on Facebook once it's all confirmed. Uh, other things that are going on, uh, we're still doing stuff online. So we've got our, if you're, if you're new to astronomy, getting to grip session, where I just talk about the night sky and <clears throat> how it kind of works. 
Um, but we all get back together um, in our new season on the 30th of September, where Mark Wadichi is going to be doing Observing the Planets and giving us a talk on that. Don't know where the venue is going to be. If the museum is open and it can be run safely, then it'll, it could well be there. It could be a, a, another venue or it'll be online. We just don't know at this point. So just kind of watch this space to see what happens. And then we got Steve Tonkin giving us a talk on the 28th uh, on two eyes that are better than one. Um, so he's really into his binocular astronomy. That's his expertise. There's loads more. This is the rest of the year going into 2021. So we've got a packed calendar. Um, so hopefully you can join us for a few more of those. Over to Roger. Would you like to take control, Roger? Okay. Hopefully you can. Roger, before you start, I've got a grey box in the bottom left side of my screen, or rather I did have, it's just gone. Yeah, I know. I noticed that with Simon, uh, something obviously that he's not able yeah. to share, that it's just I went at the top and it disappeared halfway through and I think he clicked it off. But, uh, okay, it seems to have gone, thanks. Okay. Right, oh, and then that. That was me. I don't know... Uh, how many people are into the astrophotography, but I'm just gonna go through various um, items that I use in my way of getting some of my images um, to show that you'll see this evening. Uh, I'll just go and give you a brief presentation of what I have and uh, what equipment it is that uh, gets these images that you'll be seeing uh, presented to you shortly. So obviously, okay. And... Right, so go through the equipment. Um, telescope on the mount, or we can uh, then attach uh, either an astronomical DSLR or a mirrorless camera. It depends on, uh, on your budget, but uh, just starting with an ordinary DSLR or mirrorless camera can work quite well. Uh, I use uh, a mirrorless camera for my general field um, on the mount and the astronomical uh, one on the telescope. Uh, that also needs to be connected up to a laptop or a desktop PC for uh, transferring the images from the camera, uh, which is connected to the telescope. Right, now this is one of my setups that I use. Uh, I've currently broken it down into the large telescope with a finder and then the telescope that's in the middle is a is a smaller three inch the bigger one is about a five inch and uh, depending on how big or how faint the objects are I either use the bigger or the smaller of the uh, telescopes the small the smaller one being very much useful for wide field uh, this is the camera that I use for the images that you'll be seeing tonight. It's uh, just a fan cooled, although I, I wasn't really aware of the uh, cooled cameras. This is just fan cooled. And um, the sensor you can see in the middle is 13.2 by 8.8 .8 millimeters. So it's not a full frame. So consequently, when you put that onto a camera, or a telescope, that size chip will give you a more magnified image than if it was the equivalent size of a full frame. So it's like having a uh, longer focal length telescope and it uh, brings in the details quite well. Uh, the connections that you see on the right image is just a USB 3 cable that goes straight to the laptop. And if you want to use it as a guide camera, you connect it to the uh, adjacent uh, connection that you see there. Right, now for my general um, star trails and things, I've got an Ioptron Sky Guider Pro. Um, you can set it up to uh, polar align and then you can follow the objects through as if you were using it as a telescope. 
you can connect a DSLR or a mirrorless camera on there and the payload is five kilograms. So you can use, I can use that smaller telescope on there, which I have done. Um, you can track either for the uh, lunar, celestial or solar rates if you want to uh, track those other objects. And uh, if you want to do uh, long exposures for uh, the ground as well as the night time, like doing uh, the Milky Way, you can do a half rate on there if you want to. And if you just switch it off, you can do star trails. So they're quite versatile, quite light and handy to uh, pack. As you can see, there's just a DSLR or a mirrorless camera on there. The software that um, this has got a, an electronic connection with a, a camera through the axis where the camera is mounted. It's just an ordinary ball and socket head that you use to connect the cameras. And uh, once you've got it polar aligned, you can then just attach the uh, camera or telescope if you want to, to uh, fully function as a tracking uh, um, camera. Right, so that gives you an idea of what I use. I will then show you the software that I use once I have captured the uh, <clears throat> uh, images through the telescope. Now, what I generally use is um, Astro Pixel Processor. Uh, can you see that? Not yet. Hello. No, we can't see it yet. Can't no, see your screen. Right, share the screen. Right, I didn't share the screen. Right, share. Right. Okay. So this is the program that I use to process my images. I have thought of using Pix Insight, which seems to be the de facto, which is like the Photoshop equivalent for astrophotographers, but I'm a bit bit of a newbie. I only started in March of last year when I went out to the Practical Astronomy Show and got my camera. So uh, this seemed quite a logical way of uh, going through a lot of the um, complex processes, but in a in a fairly simple pr uh, step by step tab uh, format. Okay, uh, you uh, automatically open where you would like to uh, select your images. Okay, we'll uh, just open up an image there. And then we can go through the uh, tab systems here. So raw images in photography are um, equivalent to the FITS format for astro imaging. It's basically uh, a similar type of uh, image which gives you all the raw detail straight from the camera. And uh, depending on whether you have a DSLR, mirrorless camera or astro photography camera, you can uh, select the uh, different types of uh, <coughs> processing, whether you've got a color one-shot camera or you're using a mono camera with different colored um, uh, filters. Obviously, I've got a one-shot camera because I can't be bothered to um, wait for weeks of uh, clear nights to get one lot of red, one lot of green, one lot of blue. And then you can then break down into the more uh, narrow band imaging, which a lot of people do, which is the hydrogen alpha, sulfur, and um, oxygen. And these all bring out the uh, image uh, quite well, which I haven't got round to doing. So once you've loaded up the um, images, you then select your, what they call the light frames, which are basically the images that you actually have taken with the telescope. Okay. Uh, then we've got flats, darks, dark flats and bias. That seems a bit, bit confusing, but I'll just break that down. 
the flats are what will help um, compensate through the telescope of any vignetting or anything that might be uh, dusty on the sensor. It's basically uh, taken after the photography session where you have basically a white t-shirt over the aperture of the telescope and then you just get a neutral um, balanced on the histogram of the, of the uh, photograph so it can then compensate for any vignetting or uh, sensor um, uh, deficiencies. The darks are what um, happens when you put the covering over the telescope. Uh, it's basically the same sensor settings and exposures that you have taken during the night. It will compensate any deficiencies in the, um, in the uh, sensor that uh, will bring out any hot pixels or cold pixels that uh, that might be measured in the uh, camera when it's uh, pr processed. Uh, the dark flats is basically like the dark image of the flat. So it's basically a very um, similar image to that. And the bias is the shortest exposure that the camera can take just to give you a basic read, um, sensor reading of the uh, sensor to uh, also break that down to uh, comp compensate for any uh, areas for noise. Right, so once you've basically got all those images in, uh, it will um, then go on to the calibration of the different images. If I show you uh, the uh, processes of that, uh, just bear with me a minute. Right. Right, okay. Now I've just got some uh, grab shots here of the various processes. Now with the uh, Astro Pixel processor, this uh, screen that you see here is done with a mono camera. And because it's taking images in red, green and blue filters, you've got them color coordinated in the bottom here. So obviously you can see the color coding responds to the various uh, color filters that you've got. And okay, here we are going through the various calibration films. It depends on how many uh, images that you've got and uh, the size of the images I mean, I've had um, <clears throat> some images take most of the day to uh, calibrate. So it can take up to anything between 10 to nearly 200 gigabytes of uh, disk space, depending on what you've got to uh, process from what you've done. Um, you can also additionally um, process um, multiple nights of uh, observations and it will work out um, if they're overlapping or you're doing a mosaic to get all these images up together and then finally put them all through into a image at the end of the uh, processing. So once you've got all the images through you get a final view of the uh, picture. This is uh, the small Magellanic cloud down in the Southern Hemisphere from the red, green and blue images that were um, put together and it's stacked them all into one color image. And uh, once you've got that, you can then process it as you would normally an ordinary picture into Photoshop, Lightroom, uh, Infinity or any other programs that you might be using to uh, finish off your image. 
Okay, right. So once that is all done, we then put the pictures uh, saved as a TIFF format as a uh, image into Photoshop. Now I'm sure a lot of you are aware of what this is. This is the Pleiades. You can all see this, I hope. Simon? Yep. Yeah, right, good. Yep. Okay, so this is what finally comes out at the end of the processes from my uh, imaging through the telescope. And uh, basically, it's just a few um, basic tweaks on the uh, curves. I find curves very useful for uh, adjusting this. So if I just uh, put that down a little bit and then just lots of little S curves, slowly and surely, just do it slowly, slowly, and then you can uh, gradually enhance the contrast, bring out the details. I mean, this is a fairly bright object, so obviously it uh, has uh, come out quite well to start with. But as you can see, just within a few clicks, it's um, almost almost ready. There we are. And um, going from that, from that is a fairly straightforward um, and easy one to do. This one on the other hand is um, slightly needing a little bit more work on it. This is the California Nebula if you've not seen it before, but basically the principle applies just the same. Just adjusting the curves. Gradually bring it up. If you were to uh, just import the picture straight away from uh, the uh, other program, you would find that nearly everything is right down to the black. In fact, it's almost a vertical bar. So uh, obviously what, what you need to do is to stretch out the image into uh, something which is a bit more presentable. And uh, what I'm doing in Photoshop is uh, managing to stretch out that image even more than uh, than what was there to start with. Okay, and that's that's coming. Roger, just a quick question, if I may. Yes, carry on. If you want to ask questions through the uh, talk, fire away. The the time is this sort of real time that you're do, you're changing this. Uh, these photos or, or, or yes or is this is real time doing it actually live right okay all right thanks now the uh, images that I've got here that was probably about two, two to three hours of um, one to two minute exposures so they basically been stacked one on top of the other which is what uh, the other program will do you can then um, obviously just uh, build build up and build up and uh, because of the way that it's uh, been stacked it will get rid of a lot of the uh, noise that uh, you you would normally get with just a single high um, sensitivity uh, picture would uh, would allow so uh, even if you use um, an ordinary DSLR or mirrorless camera and shoot at 3,200 or 6,400, if you stack enough images together, the uh, random noise that you would get would uh, basically cancel, cancel out any of it and it would be a lot smoother. Although you might still see some there, you can generally just um, get rid of any other noise that you would uh, get after. I mean, if I zoom in, you can still see some noise there in 
in in the uh, image here. So what I would do is uh, use one of my little plugins, and <clears throat> we would be able to see a, a comparison of a before and after. And as you can see on the right, it's got rid of pretty much all of the noise. And uh, I'm, I think that works out quite well. Okay. Can I ask two questions, please, Roger? Yes. Thank you. What's the ratio between your flats, your lights, I should say, and your darks? Well, you, need, you usually need to get a, a good number of darks. Uh, I generally take about 50, 50 darks, um, 50 bias, and um, if you want to do just flats, um, sort of, if you want to do flats as well, then do 50 of those. I mean, they're, they're, they, they're all done during the uh, morning and they can be done at any time, really. Just need to get a... I thought the darks needed to be taken at the same time as the lights. They usually do after, after but the, uh, the, the flats and the dark flats can be done in the daytime, oh, usually in the morning. Good. Okay. Because it's that's basically a, a white t-shirt that you need to put over the uh, front of the telescope to yes. correct any vignetting and any dust bennies that you might have mm. on the sensor. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. You've answered okay. my two questions. All right, okay. Gener generally 30 to 50 darks is what you need. That, but but, uh, I mean, you... but I mean, I'm very new to this and I, yeah. I get conflicting advice on the internet uh, like you should take the equal number of lights to darks or maybe only a 50 percent or 25 percent uh, yeah um, it depends on how many um light frames that you got i mean you might take 50 four minute exposures or you might take 200 one minute exposures it doesn't matter as long as you've got uh uh, say 30 to 50 darks and, right. and, and, and that, then that would be probably be oh, yeah. more than enough. And then what, um, what you can usually do is make what they call a master dark, master bias and a master flat. And then you just need to apply that to any of your other images that you've taken through the night because the setup will basically be the same. So you don't mm -hmm. need to take all the same uh, amount of um, darks and flats gotcha. and biases again. That's interesting. Especially, especially if you've got a cool camera anyway. Mm. Yeah, fine, thank you. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So that's basically that one. And if we go for Andromeda, we'll just give it a, this one looks quite anemic at the moment. So it's just a matter of trying to just, this is just a fairly simple, I'm just doing it like this because any uh, photography uh, program like Lightroom, Photoshop, Affinity, you can, you can do this um, basically the same type of way of doing as I'm doing here. I find that using curves is a lot more accurate and precise rather than just using levels because if I do levels you can't really sort of you you're you you sort of it's it's a bit of a hit and miss really as opposed to uh doing that now what i have done is um i don't know if any of you use uh nick software i find that i can use uh, a plugin called silver effects pro to make another another version of this but in black and white now you'll see why i want to use this i shall be using this for a luminosity it will help darken the background bring out the detail and give you a much better um, concept of the image i should have done that before make a duplicate image because it will end up with just a black black on my image so if i check uh, oh, yeah. silver effects 
I have tried to do uh, just a desaturate in Photoshop to make a black and white, but it doesn't have the same effects. But let me just try that minute. Okay. Click OK. Now, what you'll see is a black and white image at the top, because it's on the top layer. But when I change its properties to luminosity, it should have a, a, an enhanced effect on the image that was originally there. So if I go down to luminosity, that's just the image before, and that's just a brick. And that seems to have brought out a lot of the detail that um, sometimes you can't always get doing levels adjustments. It's a, it's a sort of a shortcut way of helping to provide a, a better contrasted image. And uh, that's sort of the way I'm going with this at the moment, learning all these different techniques. Okay, any questions? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, yes. oh, sorry, I have a question. Um, okay. I see uh, some of your plugins are uh, Athentech. Have Authentic, you... yes. Yes. Did you use any of their stuff? Uh, I have tried mm -hmm. that one, but I use either the Nick or the Image Nomic. Yeah. Um, the Noiseware, which is very good for noise reduction. Um, and some of the other bits, but those are the ones that I'm generally using just for the astrophotography. Those Absolutely. ones seem to work very well for uh, this type of image. Yeah. And I don't suppose you've used uh, uh, GIMP as the... Uh, uh, I have done, but only very okay. briefly. Okay. I'm sure that use it um, using GIMP with uh, doing levels, you can get just the same as results and you'd yeah. not pay for it because you don't need to. No. Um, um, if I can step back quite a bit, um, you showed your setup um, uh, uh, and you do the polar alignment. And uh, so how accurate do you have to be with that and, and what sort of technique do you tend to use? To um, that's, that's, that's what you need? Yeah, I mean, that one connects up. Uh, it's got no eye, what they call an eye polar um, attachment, which is a USB connection into a laptop with yeah. the eye polar software. Um, it basically rec it um, play, solves the where Polaris is, and then yeah. using your uh, left, right, up, down connections on 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 your wedge, it will then put a little cross in the red circle where you need to be polar aligned. And once you're, you've got that polar aligned, then you can take f up to five minutes exposures without any trailing at all. Um, and is that a feature of this Sky Guider Pro or is that, is that something? Uh, there are other ones, thing? yes. There's the, um, Sky, the uh, Sky Watcher, uh, which is also very similar. Uh, there are a couple of other ones. If you just go on to some of the uh, astronomy shops for uh, for the wedges, I've got. Um, I decided to put a William Optics wedge on there because it's uh, you can find uh, fine tune the uh, adjustments a lot better than uh, what came with it. But it just comes with practice, and it doesn't take. Once you know where north is from your location, it doesn't take a, less than five minutes to get it all set up. Providing you've got your tripod level to start with, and then yeah. you just connect it up, and you're away in about five minutes, really. Okay, I have another question, Roger, that's okay. Yes. Um, and don't spit feathers at this one, will you? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> You mentioned mirrorless, which I have, but it's micro four thirds. Right. How do you feel about micro four thirds? And I've That's got a 400 mil lens. I'm thinking of using one of the uh, trackers. Yes, you can, uh, you can do that. 
that's a 400 mil lens on a micro four thirds. Gosh, that'll be quite a, a good uh, focal magnification. That'll be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 800 uh, in real terms compared yeah. to 35. Now you have to make sure because of that, you need to be very accurately aligned because you mm. obviously, if you're taking longer exposures of a minute or perhaps even longer, then you might start to get a bit trailing. So mm. once you, once, once you, it all comes with practice and once you know what you can uh, get away with, then you should be able to get some quite good images, I would have thought. In the image you've got online now, uh, can you tell us which, which equipment you use for that? I mean, I, right. I won't get that now, yet, right set up, now, would I? Now all these Im now all these images were done with that astronomy camera, and the um, three inch uh, refractor. Now the focal length of that is about four hundred and twenty mil millimeters long, mm -hmm. but the chip is is smaller than what you've got, so you so should be yeah, able to a thousand something like that, I suppose. Yeah. But obviously, with the longer focal length, you will probably be getting something along the sizes of these images. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is the full frame from that twenty megapixel camera. So, um, yeah. if I had a if I had a full frame camera on the telescope, the picture would be roughly a quarter of that size. Yeah. Yeah. So. If you want to uh, do wider field, then obviously the larger sensor chip will be able to cope with that. Oh. Obviously, mm -hmm. with the, sm the smaller the sensor, the more magnified the image will be for, uh, mm -hmm. ideally, for photographing Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. You really need a, mm -hmm. a quite a, either a very long focal length telescope with a small um, chip sensor size to uh, be able to uh, get the images that you generally see from mm -hmm. uh, other uh, photographers. Yeah. Right. And, and how would you get the colour out of that one? Um, it depends on how, what your, um, how good your skies are really because um, I've got, um, I live down in Sparkford um, and I've got a south facing garden where I tried to photograph a lot of it from. Um, these, I mean, the images that you saw originally, um, there's not an awful lot of color there or there. That's how, how, that's how the camera sees it mm -hmm. after they've been processed. So there's not an awful lot of color there, but to bring it out, you can use various different filters. And if you've got the moon up near full, then you'll need quite a, a, a specialized filter like a tri-band or a quad band, which blocks out a lot of the moonlight. Uh, the special filters block out a lot of the moonlight and sodium light. So you've got uh, just the hydrogen, the sulfur, and the oxygen, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, a lot of these objects of nebula and galaxies will be able to uh, shine through right. without any problem. Mm. Right. Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. All right. But then if you do, you just have to be aware that because they are a filter and they uh, block out a lot of the other light, the exposures will obviously have to be correspondingly yeah. greater than if you sure. had a filter mm -hmm. in there in the first place. So. That's why you seem to spend lots of hours taking just a few photographs in each of these different filters. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's all right. <coughs> what do you what, recommend what? for getting focus? How do I get things in focus? Yeah, so what would you, to get the, the, the stars pinpoint on here. Right. Okay. You know, so, I, I, um, it's, one of, it's one of the things I quite often struggle with. Right. Well, you put um, something in the front of the of the telescope, which is called a Batinoff mask. Mm. It's um, if you just bear with me a minute, I'll just go and get one for you. Uh, Chris, we've got a runner. <laughs> <laughs> 
doesn't know the answer to the question. That's what it, <laughs> it was Dave. That's what did it. <laughs> Get the coffee or the tea. Or... Have you all got um, nice scopes? I mean, I don't have a scope at the moment. I'm just thinking of using my mirrorless at a 400 mil lens. Um, uh, right. my, my grab and go is a GT81 Williams Optics. So I find that perfect for most things. Right. 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 Right, now, your question of how to get things in focus. Um, this is, um, I've got two William Optics um, makes of refractor and uh, that's the cap. Now if you unscrew the front, uh, can you see? Can you share this, 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 the main, onto the main screen yeah. that we've got there? Let me just... Uh... Works, works best against a t-shirt. <laughs> oh, we saw it a moment ago. Hang on. Yeah. I'm trying to show it. Hello. That's it, yeah. Yeah, you can see uh, it's... Yeah. Now there's a... It's, it's a... A pattern there, like vertical and then two uh, lots of going into a, a, an angle of about 30 degrees. Now, when you look at the uh, stars in the telescope with this on the front, uh, it becomes a six pointed star. But you know when it's in focus because of the design of the uh, batting off, when, when it's out of focus, uh, where you see the the stars going across. The vertical line will be either to the left in the center or to the right and you adjust the focus so it all becomes six points and where the one is, that's in the middle is adjusted into perfect focus then that's that's right where it is. Okay so you have to have a bright star for that to, to actually um, see that. In reasonably the bright. So once you've got uh, picked on a bright star like Vega or Arcturus, any of the major yep. uh, stars in the constellations, then uh, once, that, you've yeah. got, once you've got them all as a six-pointed star, then you know you've got perfect focus. And then you lock it all up, I take it. And you lock it all up and hope it stays in focus. <laughs> Depending on what you're, what you're using, sometimes they do get a focus. So that means us poor astrophotographers photographers have to buy an autofocuser. <laughs> Do, do the different filters. How it goes through the night and what, what type of uh, telescope you've got, it, you can auto focus through each different shot or af after every hour or so to make sure that it's all still in focus. Because I have found that it does drift out slightly, you don't, even though you think you've tightened it up, sometimes it, it can do. And you have to make sure that the image train where the object all goes through is all still locked because that can sometimes come apart and then your focus is all gone to gone to pot. That's fair enough. So so the so the filters, do they affect the focus? So if you do use different filters and um, things? if you I've just got an uh, a, a straightforward one in there at the moment. And if I change, if I would change it over to uh, another one, then you will have to basically adjust it very slightly. So if you've got a filter with a different, or yeah, like because that. because of the way it, it it restricts some of the light through, it will you will it's only very marginally, but it would you if you kept the filters adjusted all the filters without adjusting the focus, then you will find that some go out of focus more than others. Obviously, because of the way that the light's bent through the yeah, telescope yeah. to uh, achieve because focus. Of and yeah. Okay. So um, there we are. Can, can I ask about the, the camera stuff? The, so you, you're using for these images um, a, a specialist uh, camera. Yes. Uh, rather than the DSLR. D did you do some stuff with um, mirrorless or DSLR and then with the uh, special camera and what what did you find the special camera 
gave you that the DSLRs didn't? Well, I find that um, the uh, dedicated astronomical cameras can give you um, better sensitivity uh, than you can with a, a, a normal regulated camera because sometimes the um, DSLRs or the mirrorless, if you use them for long periods of time, the sensor tends to get warm and then you get amp glow and you get horizontal lines and noise all over the picture. Um, if you use a, a, a dedicated astro camera, um, mine is a fan cooled. Ideally, I should have got a, um, a cooled one, which delivers a, a much colder temperature to keep the, the sensor from making any more noise than it would normally have got. I mean, I've done quite well, I think, considering it's a, 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 a fan call rather than a, a cord. It's, got, uh, it's like a Peltier, uh, it's got like a cooling system at the back that keeps the chip uh, set at whatever you want to, like minus 10, minus 20 centigrade, yeah. um, depending on uh, what, what uh, time of the year that you're doing the photography. And uh, it, it keeps it keeps the noise levels down, obviously, that uh, you wouldn't normally be able to control on a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. I mean, the DSLR mirrorless cameras are, are, are great. If you, if you want to uh, do general wide field of the Milky Way or other things like that. But um, generally, if you go into this more heavily like I am, then you'll want to get a dedicated astronomy camera, uh, probably a cooled one. And if you're really into it, which I'm not go got into the next level yet, then you would need to go into a mono camera so you can use the narrow band uh, imaging filters as well as the color filters to get the full range and then really get those images popping right out and get all the fine details of the dust and galaxies that you can find on all these images that uh, everyone else is getting. But as I've only been doing this for 15 months, I've, uh, I think I'm doing quite well. I mean, most of this I've done is either watching YouTube or self-taught through hours of frustration. Um, yes, I'm, I'm trying not to spend as much as they did to get Hubble up. No. <laughs> Because you're going to get the best pictures from that, but uh, yeah, because he's got he's got no atmosphere to worry about. Then. Well, absolutely. So, <laughs> but, uh, but with the camera stuff, then I, mean, I know I've checked with my DSLR, uh, for instance, with a TV remote, that it's got some uh, infrared sensitivity. Well, so, if you've got infrared sensitivity, all well and good, because yes, uh, the California not, nebula, not which is in red, becomes a bit more visible into the uh, on on your imaging. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I mean, I've got uh, a Fuji, Fuji camera, and the sensors on there are biased towards the uh, red and infrared, so uh, they become quite useful for uh, general imaging of uh, nebulas and things like that in the night sky, and you you can see the colours become more apparent um, just with those than uh, with other cameras. Okay. Yeah, very good, thank you. All right. Uh, Simon. Yeah, Roger. Uh, are we all right just to do a quick slideshow of what I've uh, managed to accomplish? We, we want to be amazed, yes. So please. <laughs> and, uh, all right. Uh, we were uh, wowed back in January, so yeah. and you say it's better. Well, so, I've, you know, I've managed to get quite a few new images, even up to the last week or two, which I've put into this presentation, just to show you what uh, other uh, magical objects I've managed to capture from my back garden. Okay, let well, me show us what Spartford's got to offer. Hmm, Spartford Observatory, as I like to call, call it. Right, okay. Now, uh, let me find where that is. Let me 
Right, now my show will proceed in a few moments. Right. Okay. Right. It never works, does it? <laughs> I know, I know, I'm pressing the wrong button. Right, okay. I hope this doesn't get too loud for you. Are you getting this? We get the music. You got the picture? Not yet. Oh, hang on. Nothing's happening here, Roger. Okay, all right. That's what I need to know. <laughs> Oh goodness me. I promised them wow, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow, cult shooting. <laughs> right, it should be now. Okay. Uh, okay, we got the title. There we go. We got a, we got a curse. There we go. Oh, uh, this good. Right. We've got a mountain peak. That's it. You got the pause button on. It's, it's frozen. Is it? Not doing anything here. Ow! Look. Is it the ball <laughs> band that's no good? We can hear some music, but the picture's still. It's frozen. Ow. When you, Roger, when you share. Um, it's there's a there's a couple of check boxes uh, when you pick a window and it usually says do you want to optimize for video. Oh right. Uh, if you do that when you do the share, that Thank might you. actually give you better quality. Right. Uh... Right. So oh I see. Ah. Yes. Right. Let's. Ooh. Oh, okay. Hang on. Ooh. Right. Uh, sure, sure. Right. right. Let's see. Let's start that again. Can you see anything at the moment? California Nebula. Right. Let me go put it to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And we'll have another go. <laughs> Do I get paid for being tech support? Yes. Better? Here we go. Yay. 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 Thank you. 
Well done. Well done. Okay. Well done, Roger. Okay. The, uh, Foto Magico. Which, yes. Um, what did that do? Uh, it's just basically, well, this is obviously on, on the Macintosh computer. It's just basically just a sequence of putting, putting pictures together with some music and different transitions okay. and zooms and twirls and things like that. It's just a... A, a, a presentation of still images or with video as well. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Okay. Uh, the bit I don't understand is you've been doing this uh, since last March. That's when you bought the kit. Yes. And you've done all of that. There haven't been that <laughs> many clear nights, have there? Maybe <laughs> in the last six weeks, but. <laughs> I did wonder. <laughs> I'm just lucky. You, 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 you've got the best weather forecast. What do you use? Because you must be out every opportunity. I am, I'm afraid. I'm sad like that. Don't be afraid. <laughs> That's really good dedication. Very, very good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. I think I need to go to the next level with a... Uh, a mono camera with broadband filters to get all these really eye-popping ones that you can see from uh, people on the different forums of uh, Facebook and stuff because there's quite a lot of stunning stuff. I did try to go into uh, the, in, uh, the Greenwich competition with the Sky at Night for the International Astronomy Photographer of the Year as recommended by Simon. Uh, I put six images in and all were rejected. <laughs> but there we go. They were just too good. In it in it to win it. It's an amateur. So like, <laughs> they thought an amateur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for sharing and, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get you back and uh, you can show us how things have gone on and you've gone to better things. Um, so uh, you've used the colour camera all the way through. So once just you start the, just monitor, the one shot colour camera, yes. Yeah. Um, so we, most of the images from this from that presentation was done on the on the three inch refractor. Hmm. Yeah, so you don't the, need huge pictures, you know, big the field, yeah. Not unless you're doing planetary. So we're coming up to a planetary season. Are you going to get yourself really engaged in the planetary season coming up? Going to get uh, some good shots of Mars and things? I'll see what I can do. <laughs> well, that's where the colour comes in, really, especially uh, things like yeah. Jupiter. I, um, have, I have tried to do, I've made a little start, but I just need to get, yeah. get my act together uh, for Ooh, doing that. Because mm. each different type of uh, aspect of photography needs different equipment. Yes. Well, that's just an excuse to buy more, isn't it? <laughs> Hmm. Yes. Roger, Roger, what's your background? Were you, were you, what's your, what was your background, Roger? Uh, that was taken uh, in the last few days. That's uh, started. No, 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 no. I mean your background, not not what's behind. My virtual you. background. 
No, 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 no. What did you do? Hobby. Oh, my hot, my work. Ah, mm. well, um, I went into print. Uh, I was in print from 1974 to 2005, and thanks to Robert Maxwell, I lost my job. But uh, that's that got my interest in photography um, going because we had to learn all the basics anyway. And once um, once I'd done the my early years in that, I I well in secondary school going back a bit, I uh, was interested in astronomy in my teens, and a good friend of mine and myself asked our uh, chemistry teacher, would we be able to do O-level astronomy if we did it off our own backs and uh, do the exam at school? And he said, okay, I'll ask. And uh, we were able to do that and we got our O-levels in astronomy back in 1974. So uh, that's where my early interest uh, in astronomy is. In fact, in the garage, I've still got the box from my 60 millimeter refractor that I bought from Dixon's wow. and all the bits for it still. So once uh, a few years back, I was able to do early retirement and uh, I got back into astronomy again. And that's where I've been these last couple of years. Good, good. Uh, you're doing very well. You're doing yeah. very well. Absolutely. I'm getting there. <laughs> but as, as you can see, most of it's sort of self-taught. So you done very well. You've been pleased with yourself. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm doing all right. My wife is you quite... See that. You don't see her because you spend all your time outside or processing. Yeah, so yeah I know. Her. It's terrible. <laughs> Do I ever get to see you? <laughs> Mind you, if I show her pictures of the moon, I don't like that. There's no <laughs> colour. <laughs> So she likes seeing all these nebulas and galaxies and <laughs> shapes that she thinks she can see in the in the gases. <laughs> so the, 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 there was a bit of a Stonehenge, wasn't there, with the yes. way above? You this see that was, from, uh, you see that from your back garden, do you? <laughs> Uh, no. no, our camera club was over there last September. We were on the periphery, which is where the Druid was for his summer solstice, just on yeah. the barrier, because you'd have to pay to go in. You mm. can set up your tele um, tripod and tracker, which is what you saw earlier, and then you just frame up the Milky Way, and uh, it was easy peasy. Yeah. Excellent. We were on Stonehenge last year as a club uh, supporting one of the English Heritage events with telescopes. So we were actually in amongst the stones with telescopes. It was kind of oh, fun. Right. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. They haven't asked us back, but uh, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> we did. <laughs> Lots of talking to okay. Anyway, Roger, thank you very much for a very interesting okay. presentation. Yeah. And, thank you very uh, much. Cheers. Thanks, Roger. Everyone okay. look after themselves over the right. summer. And uh, bear in mind the oppositions of Jupiter and uh, Saturn coming up, and Mars will be improving all the way through. And then hopefully we'll see you um, in September, on September the 30th, for Mark Radici's talk on observing the planets. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's all Thank right. You. Thank you. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, so Thank much. you all. Cheers, Bye, Thank you, Roger. If any of you want any information or help, setting up anything get in contact with me and i'll see what i can do excellent i'll do when, that when the lockdown is completely free i can come to you if need be and then we can <laughs> use your own personal equipment you're very welcome to come to spain <laughs> <laughs> i'll work on it we're allowing people over there at the moment so you might be all right yeah that's right true right. that's right that's a kind offer, Roger. Thank you, everyone, okay. and uh, we'll see you very soon. All the best. Bye. 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 Bye.